Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank, thanks, organizer, uh, Dr. Aliada, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Wei. I'm a relatively a new faculty at UC Irvine working on uh, computational biomedicine. That's really the new division we are making uh, under the School of Medicine. Uh, the really the goal is to use, in bio, to use bioinformatics, computational approach, statistical modeling to develop biomarkers for disease early detection and prediction, and also to develop new therapeutic targets for human diseases. And so, uh, and really, uh, our idea is to make the discovery on human population data first, followed with conventional translational research uh, validation in animals and cell lines. So we call this a reverse translational research. And we believe this is highly complementary uh, uh, with a traditional translational research, which start from animals and later on move to human. Um, so in order to do this reverse translational research, we need two big components. Number one, you need your own bioinformatics algorithm, uh, like the previous speaker, you know, to analyze the data in a unique way, uh, to really squeeze the juice from, from the stuff as much as possible. And number two, you need all in human big data. Then over the years, uh, my laboratory has developed uh, dozens of uh, software to process the next generation sequencing data from epigenetics, histone, chromatin, nucleosome, uh, to DMS isolation, all the way to transcriptome. And probably the most famous one is the MAX program I co-developed with my postdoc mentor, Shirley Liu at Harvard, uh, that has received 13,000 citations so far for the pick, chipset pick calling. Then all in human big data, I think the next week we're going to hear a lot of talks about those biobank data. But right now we have um, uh, UK Biobank, in the US, we have the All of Us program in which UC Irvine is a central hub. So what those programs plan to do is to recruit maybe millions of individuals with their underlying DNA sequenced, epigenetic, epigenome sequenced together with the clinical variables such as you know, imaging and a diagnosis. So there will be a huge resource for people like us, bioinformatician, computational biology, to make our own unique discovery based on those big data. And so I like to use a Sydney, what Sydney Brand said uh, to about uh, 15 years ago to really summarize this point. He wrote in a, in a beautiful comment in science, quote, uh, we don't have to look for a model organism anymore because we are the model organism. So today I'm going to share with you two stories uh, we are developing the lab. The first one is really epigenetics liquid biopsy. I'm going to show you how we can use epigenetics to do liquid biopsy for disease early detection and hopefully uh, in the future uh, for the disease prognosis prediction and the brain disorder uh, uh, diagnosis. And the second part will be uh, on a therapy's development targeting alternative pollination. Uh, I'm going to show how we develop the concept from the basic science perspective almost 10 years ago. Then later on by using the all in human big data, eventually translate it to a new therapeutic targets and translate to a potential therapy for brain disorder. <laughs> Um, I think Nell in UCLA gave a, a beautiful talk last week about liquid biopsy. Um, so really the whole idea is to get the liquid from human either blood draw or urine and followed with some kind of measurements, either protein or metabolic or measurements on the DNA within the blood. And then after the measurements, you can build some model uh, to make the prediction. Because the idea is um, the diseased individual will have something different in their blood versus the normal individual. That's really the basic idea. So the liquid biopsy is called the holy grail in diagnostic medicine because you know, it's really non-invasive and so convenient, so cheap, right? 10 bucks, you can do it. Uh, so it's, it's really hot. And uh, people believe 
liquid biopsy is the single, uh, what they call, single largest application of next generation sequencing for the general public. But for scientists, it's a completely different story. We use uh, NGS to do single cell, to do, to do uh, copy number, but for general public, the single most important thing is really the disease diagnosis. And people believe that the single largest application of the sequencing uh, machine and uh, algorithm. Right? And so today I'm going to focus on uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with field, um, we, you know, we, we have roughly hundreds of cell types in our human body. And those cells will eventually die and release uh, the DNA into the bloodstream to form the so-called cell-free DNA. But in our blood, we have a lot of enzymes to really cut off and digest the naked DNA, while the nucleosome DNA is really uh, protected by the nucleosome. So basically, the idea is the cell-free DNAs are basically like a, nucleus, uh, a mixture of nucleosome DNAs from virtually all the cell types in human body. Okay, that's really the idea. And so for cancer patients, um, people believe roughly from 0.1 to roughly 5% or 10% of cell DNA are derived from tumors, really depending on the stage of tumor and the type of the tumor. And uh, then the remaining of cell DNA are very likely to be derived from the immune cells, B cell, T cell, NK cell, you name it using the, this uh, deconvolution technology uh, developed in NAIL's lab. Uh, so so the, the idea is by sequencing the cell-free DNA, you not only can sequence the DNA from the diseased cell, such as tumor cell, you also get the DNA from the immune cells. Right? That's really the whole idea. You got the diseased cell and the immune response at the same time by a single sequencing. And we all know uh, in the DNA, we have a lot of information, copy number change, somatic mutation, rearrangement, DM isolation, right? And the question is, which one should we perform the sequencing for these highly prestigious clinical samples? And last year, there was a cancer cell paper uh, uh, in which they performed the first clinical trial on the circulating cell-free genome atlas with almost 3,000 participants. And they tried 10 different modalities, different sequencing technology on the same individuals and uh, use at, a, at a double-blinded manner. And uh, their conclusion from this clinical trial is cell-free DNA isolation was the most promising genomic feature for cancer signal detection based on this clinical trial, right? This is very objective, totally, um, uh, totally uh, unblinded, a uh, totally blind, double-blinded uh, clinical trial. The rationale behind it is um, people believe the successful biomarkers offer, offer marrow a biologically meaningful modality that is crucial for cancer onset and the progression. For example, we all know uh, most of cancer are caused by the activation of oncogene and repressive tumor suppressor gene, right? So ideally, you should sequence those oncogenes at the RNA level. But the problem is the RNA is so fragile, right? It's, it's very unstable. It's, you know, in clinical samples, they're highly degraded. So it's really feasible from the clinical setting. Another problem for RNA is it's highly unstable, right? If you drink a coffee or if you fight with someone, the next day your gene expression might change a little bit, right, somewhere. We, we don't know yet. But the DNA methylation is, is kind of accumulated effect of the transcription in the past maybe several months or several years, right? So it's highly stable, but at the same time, DNA methylation is highly tissue specific and disease specific and uh, can stay there for as long as you want in clinical samples. So that's why in this clinical trial, DM isolation has been shown to be the most promising biomarker for disease early detection. And again, the rationale is DM isolation is a surrogate for transcription, right? It's, it's like A1C for diabetes. 
the glucose level is unstable, but A1C is uh, the, accumulate, the, the average effect of glucose in the past three months. So DM isolation is very similar to A1C. Transcription is very similar to glucose level. Okay, that's really the idea. No, uh, this blood is from from, from the tumor. No, not from tumor. It's from the, the this part. Yeah, it's not from the tumor. Only. It's from the, the regular your know, nursing practice. Uh, okay. Uh. So I thought that this, the reason why cell-free DNA methylation works well is because you know like the tumor cells can kind of like they can and many of your cells are just leaking, you know, DNA essentially, right? Right. But you have um, tissue-specific uh, methylation patterns, but right. you don't really, but the sequence is the same otherwise. So right. it's like you can just identify, like if you see a lot of cell-free DNA from one tissue that's suggesting of a tumor, but it has nothing to do with transcription. It's just a mark. Or you think it's because that's showing that something's active? Right, you know, it's marked. For example, here I show you example. The first and only FDA approved blood test for colon cancer and detects the methylation of tumor suppressor genes, right? So really the idea is uh, any successful, of course, you know, tumor leakage, you see the deconvolution, you see a lot of, you know, liver cancer percentage, but that's really not very accurate in certain way. Um, but what's more accurate is to identify the methylation on those cancer driver genes, uh, right? So either way, you know, uh, it's a biomarker for a certain tissue type and also biomarker for the disease onset and progression. I think they are equally important. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, as I said, DM methylation is really a surface surrogate for transcription. That's why DM methylation is a very good biomarker for disease. And the promoter deamethylation is associated with transcription repression has been uh, in our textbook for decades, right? Has been backed up by hundreds of thousands of, uh, of high profile publications. It's really a gold standard in epigenetics and a gold standard uh, in transcription. And however, uh, in the past 10 years, since the 10 years ago with the development of uh, genome-wide sequencing assay, and people surprisingly found very poor global correlation between promoter methylation and transcription. For example, this is early work from Tim Lay's group on DMT3 mutation in leukemia patients. DMT3 is really the enzyme that writes the methylation in the genome. If the writer has a mutation, you would imagine the methylation will be changed and the underlying gene expression will also be changed. But what they found was uh, we did not detect changes in DM methylation that were directly correlated with the local changes in gene expression. Very complicated sentence, but the idea is we didn't find correlation. Um, and this is another science paper from Wolfric, yeah, I believe in the UK. And this is really their supplementary figure in their science paper. Uh, they said we find a mild negative correlation between transcription and the 5MC level. And but when you look at the figure, you just realized um, a mild negative is just a super nice way to say no correlation, right? Uh, <clears throat> so really the puzzle we had back to a few years ago was, on one hand, thousands of paper textbook proved DM isolation has strong correlation with transcription repression. But on the other hand, genome-wide assay, genome-wide data does not seem to support this hypothesis. Then what, what's the problem, right? And uh, our hypothesis was those genome-wide bioinformatics data analysis probably is not correct, right? So that's a reason, reasonable hypothesis. So let's review how people calculate DM isolation using sequencing data. Uh, right now, each uh, row is a single read from a single cell. And each column is a single CPG dinucleotide on the other read, right? White means uh, unmethylated, black means methylated. So for each CPG, each single cell is a binary uh, yes or no call. And when people get the data, they just normally do a, a 
average or some or, or mean calculation. But of course, there are many, many ways to calculate the mean. But the basic idea is they treat every CPG with the same functional role, and they take the average. Average means the more CPG dinucleotide methylated, the more functional effect, right? That's really the rationale behind the mean calculation. However, whether this hypothesis is correct um, is, remains unclear. Whether the more CPG methylated, the more effect, whether this idea is correct remains unclear. And uh, uh, the second problem is this mean calculation largely ignored the serial heterogeneity in clinical samples. For example, we have AB promoter. If you use a traditional mean calculation, AB both have 20% methylation because 20% of CPG dinucleotides are methylated in this plot, right? But when you look at the figure, you just realize it doesn't make, does not make any sense to call A and B the same methylation level. B definitely more heterogeneous than A, right? So another thing we find out was back to 40 years ago, there were beautiful biochemistry paper showing that single methylated CPG is sufficient for recruiting methylation binding proteins and for gene repression. So one CPG methylation good enough to do the job, and additional CPG methylation is only for the decoration. It has no additional function, right? And they prove it through biochemistry and very solid data. But you know, after 40 years, nobody read that paper anymore. People just take it for granted, right? So we thought this was an interesting idea. Why don't we give it a try, right? So based on uh, the paper published 40 years ago, we develop an algorithm or a metric called a charm. Uh, in, uh, it's called serial heterogeneity adjusted colonial methylation. So the idea is extremely simple. My five-year-old son can understand in two, two minutes, okay? And so the idea is instead of calculating the percentage of CPG dinucleotide methylated, we, only, we calculate the percentage of clones or percentage of reads methylated. Run rate is methylated if at least one CPG is methylated. Okay, just simple counting. In this uh, cartoon, uh, A promoter has one read out of five read methylated, right? So the methylation remains 20%. But the B promoter will have five read out of five read methylated. So the, the char methylation will become 100%. So it's really a big difference between char methylation versus traditional methylation, right? So I would say this is probably the, the, the most simple algorithm paper you ever seen in a major journal, right? Because there's no training, no deep learning, no machine learning, no statistical modeling, just a simple counting, one, two, three, four, five. And so then how it works, this is such a simple algorithm, right? And we did a report essay in which we modulate the promoter methylation at the sql CPG level. Then we measure the protein activity versus uh, either charm methylation or traditional methylation. By the way, this is the exact same experiments just different calculation at the methylation level. We showed in the report essay uh, char methylation correlated extremely well with uh, protein activity while traditional methylation as expected has very weak uh, negative correlation. Using public data we showed um, and the charm colonal, uh, the charm methylation, differential methylation correlated very well with the differential expression while traditional methylation, again, shows uh, a mild negative correlation with transcription. So in the paper we showed uh, the charm uniquely identified differentially methylated regions make a lot of sense biologically because they, they have this polycon uh, marks uh, before the tumor genesis and the polycon is really uh, highly connected in methylation in the literature. And by the way, uh, in this uh, paper, we also compared our simple, simple charm with the deep learning methods. Um, because you can really use this image, use this data as a, as a two-dimensional image to put in the CN or RN, right, to tune the parameter 
and use the expression as a predictor. And in the paper we showed the deep learning is, you know, the charm simple calculation is, is twice more accurate than deep learning methods in terms of predicting the expression. I think that really the point is um, the deep learning model is only as good as your training, as your predefined knowledge, right? But deep learning model will have no way to realize a single CPG methylation is sufficient for transcription. That model does not have this predefined knowledge for their training. Okay? So then let's go back to uh, liquid biopsy. Uh, and we showed by using charm, we can really identify new biomarkers and really increase the liquid biopsy efficacy. For example, RAS is a famous uh, tumor associated protein. And by looking at the traditional methylation, there's no difference. By using charm, we see a big difference between uh, normal plasma and a tumor plasma. And then in addition to methylation, remember I told you before, cell-free DNA are actually nucleus on DNA from all the cell types, right? And so when we look at, when we overlay the cell-free DNA rays on the genome, we can really observe this beautiful uh, roller coaster structure, which is almost identical to the nucleosome data from the cell line. And we can also observe this beautiful uh, nucleosome free region in promoters and the polydentination sites. Then in addition to methylation change, we also observe this gain of nucleosome, in, sorry, the loss of middle nucleosome in cancer, and the uh, gain of middle nucleosome in cancer in different locations, right? So by combining all the information together, uh, we develop a new algorithm. We call it a MESA, Multimodal Epigenetic Sequencing Analysis of Cell-Free DNA. The idea is we perform a targeted uh, methylation sequencing called EMSIC, and uh, we can achieve uh, roughly 300-fold or 250-fold sequencing deaths on a 4 million targeted, uh, 4 million CPG regions with 130 mega targeted region. So it's highly efficient sequencing procedure. Then from the single sequencing, we can, using, we can use bioinformatics to infer across methylation, right? Because that's the purpose of the sequencing. But at the same time, we can also infer nuclear cell organization. Uh, we get it for free from the methylation data. And, and uh, in the paper we showed, nuclear cell and the methylation are highly complementary uh, with each other in terms of uh, predicting the, the early cancer. And uh, by combining uh, methylation, nucleosome, and the other features together, we show this combined model has much better uh, cancer detection accuracy versus a single modality data, either methylation or fragmentation alone. Okay, so, uh, you know, that's really the beauty of California. We have so many industries surrounding us. We, uh, we have licensed uh, our charm and the MESA technology to a local startup company called Helio Genomics. So I'm, a, I'm their scientific advisor. And they actually hired my graduate student who developed a charm to be their vice president of technology. Uh, uh, we are working together to do multiple clinical trials for cancer early detection. And this is really our first product uh, for liver cancer detection. Uh, we call it Helio Liver. And uh, in a clinical trial setting, again, double-blinded, uh, we showed Helio Liver is much more accurate than AFP and Gallet, which are the, the, the commonly used clinical methods for cancer detection in hospitals, at least in the US. Um, and then this test is now uh, available in the US as a laboratory developed test. And we just re received uh, the CPT code from American, American Medical Association. Um, and now it's covered by most insurance company. And uh, this test is now, I think t about two weeks ago, just get approved, get, just get approved in Asia, like Asia FDA approval. Uh, and it's really the first cell-free DNA methylation test for liver cancer in the whole world that has been FDA approved by a major economy. And we are on track to US FDA submission 
hopefully by the end of this year. And so ongoing work, uh, we are very interested in uh, cancer progression prediction because early cancer detection is so busy that too many companies work on it. We think the cancer prognosis is a huge unmet clinical need. And we have roughly 2,000 breast cancer samples with 20 year follow up. And uh, those women uh, diagnosis with primary breast cancer, we, we have their blood at the time of diagnosis. And with 20 year follow up, we will know which woman will, have, will develop secondary cancer recurrence or metastasis within the next 20 years. And uh, which, part, which group of women will never have cancer progression. Right? So I think that will be critical for the treatment decisions in the future. And another big area working on is really the brain disorder detection, because again, that's huge unmet clinical needs. Uh, for example, ARS, uh, Parkinson, and Huntington disease. For ARS, we have uh, 2,000 plasma samples um, from, from a central hospital in Germany. Uh, and uh, and uh, the really the whole idea is to do the three brain disorders together or separately, so that we can find the common biomarkers for neuron degenerative disease, uh, also the specific biomarker for each disease. Right. Okay, I will pause here uh, to, if you have any questions, before I move on to the next topic. So, uh, you suggested this, uh, like you say, very simple uh, transformation. Yeah. And the competitor is to do deep learning. There's a lot of things you can do in between. Right. Like, you know, there's some universe of reasonable monotone transformation. Right. Uh, one of them is the, or, uh, the percent counting, and the other one is like the indicator counting that you're doing. And in between, there's a whole range of uh, monotone transformation that can be can be examined without deep learning or, or try to optimize over these reasonable uh, ways. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point, right? I think in the paper, we indeed compared our uh, five-year-old algorithm with uh, deep learning, which is 30-year-old, and as well as something like a 15-year-old, 20-year-old. But still, we show uh, this simple transformation um, has much better prediction power for gene transcription. Uh, I mean, the, really the whole idea is we have a very deep, strong biology behind this transformation. I think that's really the key of the success of this method. Again, no deep learning, no statistic modeling, just simple counting. My eight-year-old can understand in a few minutes. So, I, I cannot hear you, sorry. Oh, I'm asking if, uh, if one CPG is enough to the gene, so what are the biological functions for the rest of the Well, the rest of the gene is like a propaganda. It's just, you know, the single CPG is like a seed. It's go there to do the job. The other CPG is like infection, just got infected by the seed. But it doesn't, it's like a byproduct of the methylation seed but the other CPG does not do any additional job in terms of transcription. That's really the explanation for this model. Right. Uh, how much is the test? I know you said it was super cheap, but you didn't, I guess, put a price tag on the one you had. And another question is... Uh, oh, how much is the test? You mean the, this test? Yeah, you know what? Um, because it's covered by insurance, so you don't, you don't really care. Uh, but <laughs> I think if I remember correct, the CEO told me they charge insurance company $800, so it's like nothing. And uh, the actual cost is like 10 bucks for sequencing because, because it's only 77 CPG as a signature. Um, and, and it's through prescription, it's not direct to consumer. The doctor needs to go to the website, I need to file the insurance, go to the website and order the test then uh, they will send the kit to the doctor's office, then get a blood job from patients, uh, send the blood to the central lab for sequencing, and finally the doctor will get a report um, for the likelihood of tumor. 
uh, and the doctor is going to interpret this result, uh, report to the patients. And I think they charge insurance company $800. Um, and, uh, and I think what they said is if the patient has no insurance or patient couldn't afford the copay, in that scenario, they are going to cover the copay and uh, co-insurance. So basically, it's zero dollar, zero cost for patient, no matter what. Amazing. Uh, yeah, and because part of the reason is once you develop this model, the actual cost for testing is only 10 bucks, so it's, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, it's not because it has IP issue. Uh, so what we did is we released the raw data to, I believe it's EGA, uh, and uh, users can file, can submit a, a request to gain access to the data um, for the, for the non-profit usage. But you need to sign a lot of document, like uh, protection IP stuff, but it's handled by attorney, so I have no idea how it works. Right, from cell deaths, you know, eventually cells are, are going to die sometimes, right, at a certain point. And then I wonder whether it would be interesting or valuable to know from what species and what would be the proportion of Yeah, that's, that's Neil's work, and he developed a beautiful tool called Selfie, which can do deconvolution to tell you the proportion of self DNA. The, for example, maybe 5% cell DNA from liver, 1% from, from cancer, 3% from B cell, those kind of stuff. Yeah, so that's called a deconvolution. I think it's like, well, because people are just thinking this, but are there like some patients that are like very well because there are people like patients that are Yeah, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you very clearly. But the basic idea is when you do deconvolution, you will see the majorities are from immune cells. Uh, and it's highly variable people by people. Uh, so that's why, in my personal opinion, maybe the proportion of the tumor in the cell is not a very robust diagnostic tool because they have huge um, individual variants. Um, what we do is we use a machine learning. Uh, it's like case control, right? And we, we have, again, we have four million, in this case, we have four million CPGs as our Oops, I'm sorry. We have 4 million CPGs as our input. We use a machine learning and cross-validation to pick the critical CPG or, you know, lasso regression, this kind of stuff, to pick the minimum number of CPGs has the best separating power between tumor and normal. Uh, and because it's a combination, because you think about for the deconvolution, you just get one value, 0 0.3, right? But for the signature you got, 77 CPGs, you combine them together, so will be highly robust and highly sensitive because of a tumor heterogeneity. There's no single biomarker that can represent all the cases. Right? That's why we're putting 77 CPG together to have a very comprehensive risk score for the liver cancer. Okay, let me move on to the next part for the drug discovery. How? How, how we as a bioinformatics people can do drug discovery. That would be amazing if we can really do that. So again, uh, let's start it with the basic science we pursued almost 10 years ago. Uh, at that time, we have no idea whether this one could be translation or not. So uh, the stuff I'm working on is called alternative polydamination. Probably most of you are familiar with alternative splicing, right? But alternative polyindination is very similar, but it has its own very unique molecular mechanism. So the idea is at the end of the transcription, uh, a group of proteins called poly factors will add a poly tail to the full length mRNA, to, 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 to the transcription, to make the full length mature mRNA, right? Then really depends on where to add a poly tail. A gene with the same coding sequence right here can have either long 3' UTR or short 3' UTR, right? And because the polyadenation is largely based on a poly motif, AATAA, and this motif is literally everywhere in the genome. So by UTR shortening, you can imagine, uh, 
because there are a lot of cis elements in the UTR three prime UTR region, such as microine binding sites. Through UTR shortening, the gene can really avoid microine binding and avoid microine repression, resulting the protein upregulation. Because microine repression is mainly at the translational level, right? That's a very simple uh, idea of the functional role of APA. And but the beauty is. This procedure can control protein translation by avoiding micro-repression, also control protein subcellular localization, whether it's in the membrane, cytoplasm, or nucleus, and also control protein-protein interactions, because 3' UTR really serve as a scaffold to recruit interactions. Independent of transcription, independent of mRNA level expression and splicing for most human genes. So those, this independency is super cool because you can really use APA to identify new genes, then differential expression and differential expression cannot identify by other, other labs or other tools. And so this is really my point. Uh, everybody know ENCODE, right? It's really the functional elements of the, uh, the genome. And so far, I think last time I checked, they have generated 20,000 genome you know, profiling for everything uh, from high seq chromatin, ataxic, methylation, transcription, RNA binding, and the chromatin modification. Right? But look at the cartoon. They show the enhancer, they show the promoter which are critical, they show the gene, they show the transcription, but they didn't show the polytail at all. Right? The entire encode consortium kind of ignore the polyidentination, alternative polyidentination, and its role in gene regulation. That's, that was, uh, at that time, that was really an opportunity for us, a very tiny, small lab that can make some contributions, right? If we were working on enhancers, then we are competing with those labs with $10 billion funding, right? There's no way we are going to do something that are super useful. So my lab really developed the first tool of its kind to define the APA from conventional RNA-seq. So the idea is when we compare the RNA-seq density, and we do a, like a regression to identify the draw point, the transition point between trauma normal in terms of RNA-seq density, then we can um, predict, we can claim that this transition point has a newly gained polytail because RNA will stop after, RNA transcription will stop after polyidentination, right? That's really the idea. Uh, we call it the dampers. Uh, and since the paper was published, there are uh, probably um, like 20 or 30 similar tools published uh, for the same purpose. They all compare with us, and they all show they are better than us. Otherwise, they cannot get a paper published. Uh, but our tool remains the most cited and the most useful tool in the field. And so at the same year, in collaboration with Eric, we really showed this uh, APA procedure is critical for human disease. Uh, in this case, it's a GBM brain tumor. Um, when we knock down uh, APA regulator NUD21 in HeLa cells, we observed dramatic UTR shortening for 11% of expressed genes, um, such as MACP2, which is a critical gene for brain function. And we observed the same UTR shortening in GBM patients. Um, patients with short UTR tend to have worse survival versus patients with long UTR. And but the most amazing picture is right at the bottom. You look at the MACP2 MI expression level and the coding sequence. They are almost identical between the control and the knockdown cells, right? But when you look at the protein level, it's a big difference. The protein level really increased almost tenfold without the, the MRNA, with, with very little change in the mRNA with the, at the coding sequence MRNA uh, expression level. So that's, again, a very beautiful example to show APA can really control the protein translation without changing the underlying coding sequence MRNA expression level. Okay? So uh, let me skip this because I'm running out of time. And we did another paper in 2018 to show the APA is also critical for breast cancer. 
But again, as I said, I'm a, we are very small lab with four and five people, and usually it took a post of four years to do to perform AP analysis for one disease, right? Um, but the question is, for us, we are bioinformatics, we are technology developed, we are familiar with APA. But for people in the disease area, they, they, are probably, they probably heard of splicing and expression. They, they are very capable of doing this, but they probably never heard of alternative polyalanation, right? So that's why there's a big gap between technology developer and the disease investigators, right? To fill this knowledge gap, we decided to take advantage of human genetics, um, in which uh, we, you know, because human genetics has performed the GWA study for almost all the human disease, and uh, we know which SNP is associated with the disease, right? This is very unknown. So the question we ask is, is there any genetic basis of APA? Uh, and what's the function role of APA in a broad spectrum of human disease beyond the brain cancer and the breast cancer we studied before, okay? So to do that, again, as I said, we really take advantage of the GWAS data. Um, really, the idea is uh, to, to try to use APA to explain the GWAS risk value. Because traditionally, people use EQTL to explain the GWAS risk value. The idea is if the risk SNP locating enhancer block the TF binding, and then the risk allele will also change the transcription of the downstream gene, right? And, but the problem of this framework is this EQTL framework can only identify risk alleles within enhancer and the promoters, right? They cannot identify risk SNPs in other regulatory regions. And so uh, when we look at the GWAS data, what we find out was roughly 20% of the GWAS risk alleles are located in the three prime of the transcription. They are not on enhancers, they are not on promoters, there's no histone modification enriched in that region, and there's no RNA modification, M6A, you name it. When you look at the 20,000 encode tracks, nothing is enriched in this uh, gene three prime end region, okay? So we thought this was super interesting. Uh, and uh, to test this hypothesis, we uh, recently uh, rerun the entire GTAX data set with 8,000 RNA-seq data with matched genotype. And we developed a new concept in human genetics. Uh, we call it 3' UTR APA quantity tree loci. And so similar to EQTL, uh, 3' EQTL really indicates the genetic variance associated with APA of target gene. The data looks like this. You have six human individuals. GG allele on, in this gene shows long 3' UTR, while AA allele shows short 3' UTR. Uh, heterozygous shows intermediate 3' UTR, okay? So it's very dramatic data. Um, but when you look at the y-axis, you just realized and um, the gene expression, MI expression level are very similar between the genotypes, meaning this gene is not EQTL genes and can never be identified through the EQTL analysis. And, and globally, we found roughly a quarter million such three prime EQTLs as expected. They are highly enriched in the transcriptional terminal sites. In contrast, EQTLs are highly enriched in promoter and five prime of transcription. Um, mechanistically, we showed uh, those three prime AQTL can really change the poly motif, resulting the change of the poly A tail location and the change of the UTR lens. And another mechanism is those three prime UTR, three prime QTLs can really change the bind, can really perturb the binding size of RNA binding proteins. And we in the paper we did. Uh, several CRISPR editing experiments to show the SNP change at the three prime QTR loci can really change RPP binding affinity as a result to change the alternative polydenomination and change three prime UTR lens. So at least in those examples, those three prime AQTR SNPs are causal for the APA. 
And together, we showed uh, roughly 16% of uh, GUR SNPs can be explained by three prime AQTLs. This, this is really the take-home message. Um, and traditionally, everybody focus on EQTL in enhancer and promoter gene body. Everybody focus on the beginning of the transcription. But to me, the end of transcription is as important as the beginning. Again, the end of the story is as important as the beginning, right? But this end part has been largely overlooked by the genetics community and also by the QTL community. So really, our tool was able to uh, hopefully at the beginning of the end or end of the beginning to fill this knowledge gap. Um, so uh, the paper was published in May uh, 2021, um, like, you know, in my past experience, you know, at the same day, people accept, you're excited, but after a week, then, you know, you just feel, feel that's it, right? It's not really exciting anymore, and uh, you are worried about the next grant, next paper. Um, but in this case, um, after the paper was published, we got quite a lot of inquiries from big farms, um, and they told me this APA size could be a great target size for antisense oligo uh, drug discovery. Um, um, for those of you who are not familiar with SO, ASO, ASO really is a very short 20 to 30 nucleotide long, heavily chemical modified RNA that can be injected to human body uh, as a therapy. And the traditional mechanism is to use ASO to block disease causing splicing because of this RNA DNA hybridization. They can really block the splicing that cause, uh, for example, this muscle disease. And there are, se there are seven uh, antisense articles that have been FDA approved. And since ASO can block splicing, it can also block alternative polyanalation. That's really the idea. And so really, you know, they are using our data to generate, uh, to do the screening for SOs for a lot of orphan disease. And along this line, uh, we recently used the same idea to analyze uh, certain brain disorders, including uh, major depression, autism, ARS, uh, and Parkinson's. Uh, so let me show you one example on ARS, how we can find a new therapeutic targets for ARS, right? So everybody knows this is, uh, this is really a deadly disease, uh, you know, uh, and also very famous because there are a lot of famous patients. Um, so from the ARS GORs, um, there are quite a few research radio around the region called Ataxin-3. But the EQTL shows nothing, meaning those research radio never change the expression of Ataxin-3. And a Texan 3 is super important because it's a parallel gene. A Texan 2 has been shown as a therapeutic targets for ARS roughly 10 years ago in a nature paper. That's why a lot of people are trying to find something for Texan 3, but they were never able to find any molecular mechanism because um, the expression has no change between diseased patient, between ARS patient and normal. But our 3 prime AQTL shows a beautiful co-localization, uh, meaning uh, those SNPs can indeed change the APA, change the three prime UTR lens, rather than changing the transcription of this gene. So let me show the data. This is ARS brain and healthy. Um, based from the trans MI transcription level, they are almost identical in the coding sequence. But you look at the UTR, huge difference. Um, ARS patients has really uh, elongated, uh, huge elongated 3 prime UTR, which re results in the downregulation of protein level because more UTR can recruit more micron binding and more micron repression. Then uh, we uh, work with the Mayo Clinic to test this gene in their ARS brain bank. Yeah, this is highly prestigious material. We showed a Texan 3 really protein level really indeed decreased dramatically in ARS brain uh, and versus control. And uh, this uh, Ataxin-3 protein level correlates very well with TTP-43 aggregation, which is a hallmark of uh, ARS. And uh, we did uh, a few in vitro and in vivo assay to show indeed when we knock down Ataxin-3, we see a, a very dramatic accumulation of PTP-3 
again, it's a, it's a hallmark of ARS. And I think we recently just got a grant funded, uh, and uh, a drug company in Oxford, UK received the money, so they are obligated to develop uh, antisense oligo targeting this gene. Uh, we have uh, IPS uh, stem cell model and a mouse model to help the farm company to refine these ASO drugs. So let me skip this, and we do this again in all the cancers, find the new cancer genes, and, uh, and uh, this is another interesting story, right? I show you the brain disorder. I have, previously, I have no idea about brain disorder, but uh, through human genetics, we are able to find a new gene for human brain disorder. Let me show the final example on type 2 diabetes. Again, by training, I have zero knowledge on diabetes, right? But again, using human genetics, we nominate a new gene for type 2 diabetes, which shows the biggest, very dramatic UTR change between uh, uh, T2D patients in their eyelid on sick versus control. Uh, and uh, this guy, uh, he's a physician scientist, uh, developed a transgenic mouse model uh, with a gene knockout, uh, heterozygous knockout, and he showed uh, the knockout mice indeed has a very dramatic glucose tolerance versus control mice uh, with a high fat diet. So that's indeed an important gene for diabetes. Uh, so this is really the summary of my talk. Sorry, I'm running a little bit longer. And the first part is hope I can convince you we can use big data and bioinformatics to develop new biomarkers for human disease. Uh, I show you several examples on epigenetic liquid biopsy. Uh, we have this charm algorithm. It's, in my opinion, it's probably the most simple algorithm paper you can ever find in a scientific literature. Uh, we have this method technology to do multiple model analysis. Uh, the second topic is really on a therapist targeting APA. And I hope I can convince you that APA is an emerging molecular phenotype to explain a large fraction of GWAS risk alleles enriched at the end of the transcription. Uh, we can do in silicon APA targeted discovery and uh, develop RNA therapies uh, based on antisense oligos and the small molecules. Uh, I would like to thank all my lab members and the collaborators and my funding source and thank you so much for your attention.